social media changed my life. When I was at school, Facebook was banned from all the computers. And it was kind of condemned as a tool for procrastination or worse, narcissism or judgment amongst friends and classmates. And I felt like, you know, when teachers and parents were talking about it, they used a kind of disapproving tone. And maybe they were right, you know? I would probably be horrified to find out how many hours I'd spent mindlessly scrolling through my news feed or kind of senselessly moving my thumb in that upward motion up my phone screen. However, one day last year, the day came when social media changed everything for me. It was just under a year ago, and it was the day that I decided to go to the camp in Calais, the refugee camp, known as the jungle. And it was back at a time when the media was using lots of dehumanizing terms to describe the camp. Things like marauding migrants and swarms of migrants. And it left me with a lot of questions in my mind as to who are these people and what's happened to them and how did they get to Calais and what's life like in the camp? So I made the decision to go. And even though people told me I was crazy, they told me that I wouldn't be able to just turn up, I got in my car and I did. And what I experienced that day will stay with me forever. The positive, incredible, inspiring people that I was met with, the most humble, dignified, welcoming people that I'd, I'd ever met in my life. And despite living in the mud with nothing, they still wanted to share everything from cups of tea to the food that they had to their stories. And it was humbling and it was uplifting and it was devastating all at the same time. And that night, I went home and I was lying in my comfortable, warm bed and I felt really emotional and confused by the conflicting news reports with the reality of the situation. And I felt compelled to write a post on my own personal Facebook page to share with my friends and family the stories of the people that I'd met that day and the lives that they were living in the camp. And I fell asleep, feeling pretty emotionally and physically drained. And I woke up a few hours later for work. I reached for my phone, which is usually the first thing I do in the morning. And I got the shock of my life. That post had been shared thousands of times whilst I was sleeping, reaching millions of people. And I I was totally shocked. I didn't even know that was possible for my own personal Facebook page. And my brother always makes the joke that before that day, he'd never seen me get more than 20 likes on a status. And it was true. You know, my dad's words rung really strangely in my ears that morning. He said to me, Jazz, how does it feel to go viral? And I went to work as normal that day. And before, I, you know, I had to have my phone on charge the entire day because the notifications were just relentless. And before I knew it, that post had been shared over 65,000 times. And it was no longer to, possible to add me as a friend on Facebook because I'd reached my maximum limit. And that night, my brother called me from London and he said, Jazz, I just heard some people discussing your post on the tube at London Bridge. And... In the next few days, I was contacted by every news channel, every magazine, radio stations, and I, it was scary, it was overwhelming. I, I didn't even know how they got my number, and I wasn't media trained, and I didn't know anything about the refugee crisis as a whole. The only thing that I could draw on was my own personal experience and the things that I had seen. But it seemed that Underneath the politics and the fear-mongering and the sensationalist headlines, people were ready to hear, or they wanted to hear, this raw emotional truth. And people responded in their thousands. So many people came to me saying, how can I help and what can I do? And I actually did something pretty stupid in that post, right, that I've got to tell you guys about something that people tell you not to do. 
But I had said that I'd be going to the camp again and that people were desperate for shoes and warm clothing. And if anyone had anything that they wanted to donate, just pop it over. This is my address. <laughs> <laughs> that was the stupidest thing I've ever done because we were in undated. We were bombarded with stuff. It was completely overwhelming. You know, warm clothing, shoes, tents, sleeping bags, Amazon delivery after Amazon delivery. The postman, that came in his van and everything in there was for us. You couldn't move in my parents' garden and driveway and garage. Everything was covered in this outpouring of generosity. And people came to our door crying and they, they pinned notes of compassion and love to food packages. And, you know, it was incredible. We got a lot of amazing donations. We also got some not so useful donations. High heels and bikinis are not what people need in a refugee camp. <clears throat> but my friends and family gathered around to do what they could to sort the donations and to channel this enthusiasm into something that was tangible and useful for the camp. And before my eyes, that one innocent post it turned into a movement, a movement of inspired international citizens that were desperate to take action. That one post filled warehouses across London. It turned into thousands of hours of work and hundreds of volunteers going to the camp to do what they could. And not just that, we'd set up an innocent little Just Giving page, which before we knew it, raised a quarter of a million pounds and it became Just Giving's largest crowdfunding campaign ever, overtaking the long-standing Doctors of the World campaign to support the camp. <laughs> so I quit my job in London and I, I couldn't concentrate on anything else but the humanitarian crisis unfolding on our doorstep, you know, we live in Kent, it's right there. And so I spent as much time as I could in the camp, sleeping there, eating there, really trying to understand the needs of the friends that I was making there. And I watched as it grew, I watched as it became tents in the mud to a place where people were actually able to maintain a level of dignity with wooden shelters and regular food distributions and enough warm clothing for people to actually sleep at night despite the freezing cold weather of northern France. And the change was rapid, not just in the conditions and the situation in the camp, but also in the number of volunteers. You know, the first time I went to that camp, I didn't meet one British volunteer. And now there's hundreds there on a weekly basis. And not only did people want to actively do something, but people also wanted answers. People were intrigued and they were interested. They had the same questions that I had that first time that I went to the camp. And so I continued to write about my experiences on social media, I continued to write and tell the stories of my friends and what was happening in this camp. And engagement was high. The response was immediate. And the tangible results were just overwhelming every single time. One post could trigger thousands of pounds in donations or hundreds of blankets. For example, if we said that the people in the camp were cold, people donated from all over the world. And I started to really use social media to raise awareness, to bring a voice to those people that weren't being heard, an identity to the individuals that I was making friends with and a face to those caught up in this crisis that were living through this trauma. And very quickly, I really began to understand and respect the true scope of this wonderful, powerful tool that we all have at our disposal. Anything was possible. Everything that we needed, the community that we'd created through social media, found it for us. You know, someone knew someone who knew someone, or someone tagged someone, and suddenly things were just happening. 
Like outside of what I even knew about, things like fundraising events were being organized all over the country and groups and information pages and donation collection points. And communities were uniting via Facebook with a common cause. As our Facebook reach increased, so did our impact on the ground. And our work extended across Europe from Idomeni and Lesbos in Greece to the hungry Croatia border to Turkey and to Jordan. And when I met volunteers like Ella and Michael, a Norwegian couple who had given up everything to cook thousands of meals a day for refugees arriving by rubber dinghy to Lesbos, I was able to set them up a fundraising page to tell their story through social media and direct people to it. And this instantly enabled them to stay for an extra few months by covering their expenses. And finally, the story of Alaman, who is a little boy that I found out about just this week. Now he's stuck in a camp with his mom and his dad and his younger sister in mainland Greece. And he's been sick for a while, but just this week, his condition seemed to rapidly deteriorate. And suddenly, it seemed clear that he was dying. Now, no one really understood the motor neuron disease that he was, seemed to be kind of suffering from. And while he was visibly lying there, worsening on the floor of this UN tent, his family had minimal resources or access to information, and they had no idea what to do. And the worst thing was that his younger sister seemed to be showing similar signs of degeneration. And they were told that, you know, whatever he was suffering from, it was likely to be genetic. Now, people were throwing around various diagnoses, things like Lyme disease or cerebral palsy, and no one, but no one was really sure why this little boy suddenly seemed unlikely to live past the age of seven years old. And so a few volunteers put a call out on Facebook to try and find a neurologist in Greece. And the next morning, we woke up to the most incredible result. People had offered to help. So many people had offered to help, from neurologists to media representatives to people offering to donate money to pay for Alaman's medical um, needs in Greece. But best of all was the response of a Swiss doctor named Matt. Matt had managed to make the impossible possible. Matt, within 24 hours, had got visas for the whole family to go to Switzerland so that Alaman could have the medical support that he so needed. So the family flew to Switzerland, and he's having the medical attention that he deserves. Now, social media, it triggered a, a movement, a grassroots movement of people that saved lives, not just in the camp in Calais, but many camps and many lives across Europe and the Middle East. And so we thought we would bring it back to the camp. And we used money that we raised through social media to install Wi-Fi in the jungle in Calais and the camp that we worked in in Lesbos. And this was a direct response to the needs of the people that we were meeting and what they were asking for. Because it seemed that the, resident, the residents of the camp were desperate to connect with not just the friends that they had lost along the way, but also their family members that were living back at home under totalitarian <coughs> regimes or amongst war. And it showed me that when you have nothing left, you cling to those relationships, those people, that, that desperate hope that your loved ones are safe. And social media kept these lines of communication open and easy. And our little organization now has plans to connect over half a million refugees in refugee camps across Lebanon. So this last year has seen me go from working in fashion in London 
to sleeping in tents in refugee camps in Calais, to speaking at the UN headquarters in New York. And this experience has opened my eyes and my mind to the world of opportunities that social media has created for all of us. You know, no longer is this world big and scary. No longer are people far away or different from us. No longer can we separate ourselves from these humanitarian crises with distance or lack of information. We're all connected. We're all the same. And underneath language and culture and religion and race, we're all human. And social media is this wonderful, amazing tool that's imperative and inspiring and creating this community of conscious international citizens that care about the world and the people that we share it with. Now, I'm not saying that I no longer scroll through selfies and cat gifs. Of course I do. But I also uphold social media as a powerful tool for social change. With the ability for anyone to share their opinions and have their voice heard, this brings power and responsibility to each and every one of us to use this resource effectively. You don't need the time to volunteer. You don't need to have the money to donate. You don't need to be on the front line building shelters in Calais or bringing boats to safety on the shores of Lesbos. All you need is to share a post, to embark in open, honest conversation, to read, to listen, to spread the word of compassion and love from the comfort of your own bed, your toilet, your sofa, or your train seat. What a gift it is to live in a world where the power is at our fingertips. Let's step up. Let's use this effectively to create a world which is more beautiful, more connected, and a more compassionate and loving place to be.